Hello, and uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome from me, Michael Scott in the United Kingdom, and from my joint convener, Sanford J. Ungar in Washington, DC, to the 32nd jointly promoted event between the Future of the Humanities Project and the Free Speech Project. The latter is sponsored by Georgetown University and the former by Georgetown's Humanities Initiative in association with Campion Hall, Oxford, and the Las Casas Institute for Social Justice in Oxford. Together, the two projects consider issues concerning human dignity, rights, cultures, histories, traditions, and freedoms in a wide spectrum of educational activity, policy, expression, and aspiration. In a moment, I'll hand over to Sandy, who is the director of the Free Speech Project. He will introduce today's distinguished guests and moderate the ensuing discussion before I return to chair the question and answer session towards the end. From the start, you can type in questions to the panel by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please do not use the chat button, use the Q&A button. These questions will come to me during the session and I will try and put them into to the panel uh, later on to consider. We urge you to ask questions as and when they occur to you so that there is not a bottleneck at the end. I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. So over to you, Sandy. Thank you very much, Mike, and uh, welcome to everybody who's joining us today. Uh, I suppose there's a bit of at least cheekiness bordering on heresy for us to be asking a question of whether one of the world's oldest democracies is endangered. And uh, we have some interesting questions to discuss. Before we go any further, though, I want to note that whilst we're all free to have such a conversation and to be provocative and insightful, uh, a colleague of Max Colchester, who is one of our panelists today, Evan Gershkovitz from the Wall Street Journal is in prison in Russia, a notorious prison in Russia, on trumped up charges and is unable to speak freely. And we all regret that and want to make sure we call attention to it and call on people, free people all over the world, to put pressure on the Russians to let Evan free. Having said that, let me introduce our panelists for today. Um, John Battle is a former Labour Member of Parliament. He's from Leeds. He's in Leeds today and uh, stalwart of the British Labour Party, who's held many important posts, including as Minister of State at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Laura Beers uh, is Professor of History at American University, just a mile, about a mile away from where I am sitting on the campus of Georgetown University here in Washington. And uh, she focuses on modern Britain. Her most recent book, Red Ellen, The Life of Ellen Wilkinson, Socialist, Feminist, Internationalist, History of Britain's Second Female Cabinet Minister, has been winning awards and is celebrated around the world. Max Colchester, the UK correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, is with us. He is a very experienced journalist who has uh, worked in Paris previously and uh, covered uh, many financial crises in London and elsewhere, an expert on the financial markets. And uh, Baroness Jenny Randerson is here as well. Uh, she's been a member of the House of Lords since 2012, 11 years now. She's spokesperson there for the Liberal Democratic Party for Transport. And uh, Jenny, I'm glad to say both you and John have been with us before, and we're very happy to have you back. So what about this heresy of saying that uh, one of the world's greatest democracies is endangered? Is that, is that uh, sensationalist? Is it overstatement? To what extent might it be true? Jenny, let's start with you. Well, I think uh, the danger is that we are far too keen in Britain on relying on that old trope. Um, and we congratulate ourselves on our history all the time. And actually, all democracies need to be refreshed. And uh, we do not have the mo modern mechanisms 
that we need to ensure that, uh, that we keep our democracy smart enough to cope with modern circumstances, uh, with the age of social media and so on, uh, with the modern desire of people to be very directly involved, and we have that with a fatal combination, I believe, of a government that is uh, intent on circumventing democracy, on centralizing and on doing away with quite a lot of the, the little intricacies that only people directly involved in the process possibly are aware of but are absolutely fundamental to the involvement of parliament and therefore of the people that parliamentarians represent. Thank you, um, Max Colchester, that young new uh, prime minister of the United Kingdom is headed to Washington this week to meet with his American friends. And uh, what would you call to Americans attention to uh, if they could ask him questions, what would what what should we be asking Rishi Sunak? Gosh, there are so many questions they should be asking Rishi Sunak. I I think that the first thing Americans should bear in mind is that there's a high likelihood that Rishi Sunak will not be in his current job. Um, you know, uh, in the next eighteen months, uh, his Conservative Party are way behind in the polls versus the uh, opposition main opposition Labour Party. Uh, the British economy is not doing particularly well. And Rishi Sunak, you know, he's billed himself as a, as a kind of technocrat who's come in to try and fix Britain after, let's be honest, several years of chaos um, under the, the ruling Conservative Party. But so far, the fix isn't there. Uh, we see big problems with the nationalized healthcare service here. We see big problems uh, with the economy, with inflation remaining suddenly high, being one of the highest, actually, in the G7. Um, and he's also reneging on a key key plank of his platform, which is to try and curb immigration, uh, illegal immigration especially. So he's a he's a politician who's facing several problems, um, and I think many see this visit to the U.S. Uh, as a as a as maybe as a distraction, really, uh, from his very difficult domestic agenda. Laura Beers, uh, thank you, Max. As an expert on modern British. UK history, how would you rate the problems that Britain has today compared to uh, other things in the recent past? Well, I guess it depends what metric you're measuring it on. I mean, we in the United States think of ourselves as facing unprecedented or not unprecedented, but not seen for several decades levels of inflation. Um, but compared to the United Kingdom, where you've been looking at double digit inflation um, for the past year, and rising interest rates. I mean, we've seen those again in the US, but you're talking about a difference in, in scale that is almost large enough to be a difference in kind, which is a real, um, you know, whatever Rishi Sunak's plus is, if he were facing such an economy, he might be unlikely to, um, to win another election. But he's also come in now as the third prime minister um, since the last time a general election is held. So there's a real democratic deficit in terms of his claims legitimacy in the wider public, despite the fact that his party won the last election. Um, you know, there is also this issue of immigration, as Max raised, and though he's been touting a reduction in small boat crossings, I mean, we worry about people crossing the, the southern border from Mexico, but, you know, in Britain, it's more people using small boats to cross the English Channel um, from the French coast, right? And he's been, he's been trying to tout those reduction in numbers, but there still is a huge surge of immigration, um, which is perceived as a problem. So I think he is in a difficult position politically, and it is um, not without precedent, but um, probably a more difficult position than British politicians have seen them in for quite some time. John Bennell, the, the polls of the moment seem to uh, favor the Labour Party, but polls are increasingly discredited in this country for their inability to predict what's really happening. Do you think, uh, now I know you're a, you're a member of the Labour Party, you've held office for the Labour Party, but let us hear what you think its prospects really are in next year's presumed election 2024, and what would be different if Labour were elected? 
Yeah, I, I live in, in Leeds in what's the classic inner city where I've lived for 40 years and have the privilege for representing. So my neighbourhood will be seen as um, working class plus uh, migrants from all over the world, particularly Southeast Asia. It would be um, a low income gig economy um, area where I live. And I have to say, I, I should declare an interest as someone who was campaigning in the local election. I'm still a member of the party and do the legwork on the streets, knocking on the doors. There's a deep, deep disenchantment and a deep gulf between those experiencing um, in-work poverty and lack of secure work uh, and the rundown of public services and the political group and the political system, if you like, whether it's Labour or Conservative at the national level, there's a feeling of a massive, massive gulf between the experience of people going to the supermarket experiencing 18% food inflation and the commentary nationally. And that has been expressed in the local elections quite interestingly. In the working class neighbourhood where I live, the turnout in the May elections was lower than usual because people said, well, we're labor in this area anyway, but we're not getting any vision of where we're going. But interestingly, and the strategy wasn't quite this, in the more middle-class suburbs and the areas of Britain where labor didn't expect to do well, labor did better because as it were, the band in the middle is terrified of dropping down into the band of the lower e incomes. So whereas the arrows pointed upwards before, as they moved up the income scale for themselves and their children, a lot of people are dropping downwards. And it was that band in, in the middle that voted Labour in the local elections. But I would say the shift and the polls look good, but what's lacking is the vision to bridge that gap. And I think the um, inequalities are now greater in Britain than in America, according to the, the latest numbers. And that is causing a cultural divide as well. Sounds, it sounds pretty serious. Um, a lot of people here in the US are saying, how did Britain make this terrible mistake of Brexit, leaving the European Union. And so I wonder, uh, it, was it a mistake? Was it the disaster that it appears from a distance to be? Or was this uh, inevitable, given well, some of the old tensions the, the, between? I'd like to go to someone else and come back to you in, in just a moment, John. Uh, Jenny, what do you say about that? I, I, I would say it's a, it was a total mistake. It was totally predictable mistake. The statistics tell us that what we were condemned for, Operation Fear, actually turned out to be Operation Understatement in terms of the economic impact of Brexit on Britain. Um, we're talking about £20 billion a year less for public spending, that's 385 million pounds a week. And I put it like that because Boris Johnson sold us Brexit or sold the supporters of Brexit, the idea that there was going to be 350 million more per week for the NHS. And there's actually 385 million mm. less per week. Uh, so that, you know, trade is down by 13 and a half percent investments down by more than that amount. It has been an unparalleled disaster. Mm. At the mm. same time, it's been deeply divisive in the mm. country, very, very bitter. And mm. even its strongest supporters, the Lord Frosts, the Nigel Farages of this world, now say it's a failure. Now they, of course, blame it on other people. <laughs> Um, but of course, we got there because Britain has always been a slightly detached member of the, the European Union, uh, partly for historical reasons, partly for geographical reasons. But we got there because David Cameron was trying to be too clever by half and uh, control his right wing by um, marching them into a referendum that he thought would put an end to the divisions in the Tory party and actually stoked the divisions in the country. 
And going back to what John has been saying about how people feel in the country, the whole country, apart from the, the cream of wealth at the top, if I could put it that way, is feeling the pinch financially. Mm. Businesses mm. are feeling mm. the pinch. And therefore, we are in a huge mess going forward. Mm -hmm. Max, uh, does, does, do the English people, do, does the UK get a second chance at this if it throws up its arms and says, we made a mistake, we're sorry, will you take us back? Is that yeah. something that anyone can imagine? Yeah, I mean, I think just building on what Jenny said, there's, I think there's a forgotten fact when people, especially in America, try to understand why Brexit happened and what could happen next, is that you've got to remember that there were actually two pro-Brexit campaigns during the 2016 referendum. There was one that operated on a very protectionist ideal, i.e. that immigration should be stopped and that Britain should close its borders. Mm -hmm. And there was another one fronted notably by Boris Johnson, which was much more globalist in outlook and believed that Britain should open its borders and become a free trading nation and break away from the EU to better do deals uh, with countries in Asia and America and so forth. And obviously these two ideologies are, are polar opposites. And when reality bit and the Brits had to choose which one they were gonna go down or which one they were gonna go with, they actually haven't chosen either. You know, So we've got this position where Britain doesn't know whether it wants to be protectionist, whether it wants to be a free market, you know, free trading nation. And this all happened at the time, obviously, of COVID and so forth, when basically globalization was pushed to the back burner. So you've got the situation where basically Britain is still struggling to find its way post-Brexit. Now, whether the EU would want to take back Britain, even if Britain did want to, I think the mo at the moment, the poll of polls showed that around 57% of Britons would like to rejoin the EU. Um, but that's not, I mean, whether that's high enough, uh, to actually warrant mm, it's uh, very, it's uh, maybe maybe not but I mean mm. you know Brave would be the government that makes that call and also secondly the EU might, might fear that even if under a Labour government Britain does try and rejoin the EU uh, that a Conservative government would win the subsequent election and pull them out again so I think the, the chances of a British rejoin are, are short in the in the near term but not to be you know ruled out yeah well. it's not the mm. go ahead John I don't think the game's over. One thing I would remind everyone is there is a, a review due in an, about a year's time of the terms. Uh, and I, I've got in front of me the, the, a massive newspaper graphic. Do you think Brexit was good or bad for the UK? And this, in a way, I completely agree with Jenny. And I would say as someone that fought a Liberal to get into Parliament, let me just say to Jenny, the Liberal Party have been courageous in champion in the EU and membership. Uh, and at the moment, it's still, even in my own party, a no-no to mention the word because it was so divisive. There's a tremendous fear of even mentioning Brexit. Yet the figures show only 9% of Britons consider Brexit more a success than a failure. 62% describe it as a failure. And among those who voted leave, 37% now say Brexit was a failure and 72% say the government handled it badly. And as just been said, 56% now say it's a wrong move. So the tide is turning. And, and another positive in this is Northern Ireland, where my wife comes from. If you remember, we went for the hardest, most drastic terms of Brexit, which we didn't need to do. Yet Northern Ireland then presented a massive problem with the Good Friday Agreement. So they've got a hybrid. And in Northern Ireland, there's a real danger that because of the way Brexit has been ha handled, that we could have a united Ireland before Scotland leaves because of the way Brexit's been handled. But at the same time, the Northern Ireland agreement with the South, with ERA, actually demonstrates the contradictions where we're half in and half out of the EU. And I think that does offer the challenges for the review. So I actually am quite positive that the terms are shifting. Whether that means we rejoin exactly on the altar, just jump, jump back in again, I doubt. But the space for negotiation and diplomacy there uh, in the future. Uh, at the moment, I think courage, uh, I completely agree with what uh, Jenny said. Courageously, the Liberals have championed it. And I think the terms are turning in favour of that conversation at least being opened again. Laura, what, what do you think would happen? How would the uh, European Union react to a British application to rejoin? Well, I, I think that was really I'm interesting. A, I'm sorry, I'm asking Laura, John. Yeah. 
Oh, Sandy, I have to say, I think it is a non-starter and partly for the reason that John just alluded to in that the members of his party don't want to touch Brexit with a barge pole because well, it was naturally so divisive, but it was also divisive amongst the Labour Party. And I think they want to sort of write a line under it and move forward. And I think what you're more likely to see if a Labour government comes to power is effectively a renegotiation of the Brexit arrangement so that you have Brexit in name only, you know, a realignment where the United yeah, Kingdom yeah. agrees to play yeah. by the regulatory and trade rules and free movement of people and of yeah. goods of the European Union. So that effectively Britain is saying that they've Brexited, but is, uh, you know, behaving yeah. as if they are still within the EU. What that will mean in terms of Jenny's um, comments about, you know, funding and the loss of funding that comes with leaving the EU is that probably the, you know, the distribution of money to deprived areas, um, you know, the the economic me mechanisms of unity won't be there. But I think in terms of trade and potentially things like um, collaboration in European wide research grants, which as an academic, mm -hmm. I'm very conscious of colleagues within the within Britain, you've had to pull out of ERC, European Research Council funded projects um, after the departure from the European Union, that some of those collaborations might mm -hmm. reopen. Yeah. But Agreed. I don't think that rejoining is, you know, on anyone's radar really as a real. Yeah. No, I agree with all those terms. So I negotiated the original uh, Research Council deals in 1987 after 10 years of stalwart. But I, I think it, it's the terms, isn't it? How we put the language together again. I completely yeah. agree with you. Um, what I are think, the, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jenny. I was going to say, I, I, I agree that with Laura that we, we, we almost have to serve a period of penance. Um, <laughs> and the EU has to learn to trust us as a nation again, and as a series of governments, whatever color they are, they have to learn to be able to work with us again because working in that sort of format does require trust. But we do have to take very rapid steps to rebuild the relationship at a trading level. Uh, as, a, as, a, as the chancellor of a university myself, I fully endorse the points being made about uh, research funding and so on. It has made a huge difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and people, you know, there are so many strands to this. There's the, the young people and their ability to uh, live, work, uh, travel abroad. There's the undermining of our transport links from one country to another, as well as the uh, basically the trading relationship on which so much of our economy uh, rests. So it's, it's a very broad harm and it is going to take very broad action to repair it and it's not going to be done quickly mm. i must say that a lot of the attention that the uk is getting in the american media at the moment is not about some of these issues it's more about the royal family and the coronation of king charles the third etc and and especially prince harry and and uh, his issues but uh I, I, as we were preparing for this uh this discussion today, I was totally surprised by something that happened that's very much in the bailiwick of the Free Speech Project, which is something called the Public Order Act of 2023. Uh, Max, could you tell us what the impact, what the mm. import and impact of that have been? Yes, this was a very controversial piece of legislation which was passed by the Conservative government, effectively in response to um, guerrilla campaigns by environmentalists, uh, groups such as uh, uh, Stop Oil and so forth, where they were sort of running into the middle of highways to stop cars or attaching themselves to buildings. And it was, a, and it was something that was creating a headache for the government because uh, these protesters were stopping some voters from taking part in everyday uh, activities such as getting to work and so forth. And so the government took a very draconian step to try and appease its uh, conservative base by passing a law that effectively allows uh, police, um, uh, you know, in certain areas when there are protests taking place in theory to, to stop people and arrest them and search them, even if they have, even if they're just under suspicion uh, of causing um, public disorder. And this has been um, a very controversial thing. And we saw it put into practice, actually, the other day uh, during the coronation of King Charles, where 
um, a group of anti-monarchists called Republic, uh, who've been planning a protest for months and have been in touch with the police about this. And they, they turned up at 6.15 on the morning of the coronation and were just arrested straight away, even though they didn't even do anything. They weren't going to attach mm -hmm. themselves to anything. They told the police they were going to do this and their founder was taken away and the police later had to offer a semi-apology for what they did. And I think it's raised some very big questions as to whether this law is using a sledgehammer to crack a nut and whether the police really has the, the moral integrity to or the response should have this kind of power at its disposal. And I that... And that, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Jenny, please. I, I was going to say, uh, that action that, that Max has just explained um, was after the, the House of Lords had overturned the definition mm. and, uh, of serious disruption. Um, the government has now decided that it's going to extend that act mm. Mm. even further so yeah. that the definition of serious disruption will be anything other than the most minor disruption and would include things like walking backwards and forwards across the highway. Um, so, so this is very serious because they, the, yeah. the way they're overturning that definition yeah. is through secondary legislation. And in the United mm. Kingdom, in Parliament, you don't get the scrutiny of secondary legislation that mm. you get of primary Absolutely. legislation, and you cannot amend it. You can either accept it all or reject it all. Um, it's uh, it's being discussed tomorrow. There is a in the House of Lords as a fatal motion. We haven't passed a fatal motion in the House of Lords mm. since 2015. And it would be pretty momentous if we agreed to it. But if we don't, if we let the government get away with this, mm. we are on the same route, I would argue, and this is, you know, drawing a historical parallel that others may argue with, but I would argue we're on the similar route to Germany in 1933 when they passed their Enabling Act, which took away the checks and balances yeah. and the parliament, the scrutiny in the Reichstag and allowed mm. ministers to have complete say-so over legislation and the details of legislation. And that was one of the threads that enabled the growth in power of the Nazi party. Now, I don't want to be over dramatic on that, but I do think it's worth looking at the historical to, parallels. To give a, Sarah, what to give do a, you say about that? Well, just on the historical parallels and also to give um, some context for our American audience. And Jenny sits in the House of Lords and it's effectively the upper chamber, but it doesn't function quite the same way as our US Senate. Um, while people have partisan political identities, several members of the chamber, some are um, cross bench or decidedly unpartisan. And there's less of a sense that, you know, there's a majority of one party and therefore they'll be whipped and all behave in the same way. And one of the places where we really have seen in the last few decades, the Lords assort their authority was the last time that erosion of civil liberties really came up for discussion in terms of the terror acts um, following 9-11 put in place by Tony Blair's government and the pushback of not just liberal Democrats, but many liberal democratic MPs in, or I mean, um, members of the Lords against suspensions of habeas corpus um, in the name of defending against terror. And I wonder, Jenny, what you think the likelihood is that the Lords, again, might be able to sort of save civil liberties in Britain by really effectively pushing back against these moves by the government. Well, the problem that the House of Lords has is that, of course, we are an unelected chamber. And that is the difference uh, from the United States. So we are constantly, mm -hmm. when in 2015, we pushed back with a fatal motion, we, there was then launched uh, immediately an investigation into the powers and the use of those powers of the House of Lords. Now, at the moment, and I'm a very fervent supporter of an elected House of Lords, but I do think just at the moment, we have to be very careful in Britain about the, uh, the, 
putting our, the House of Lords um, into the equation until we've sorted the mess in the House of Commons. Because the one reason why the House of Lords is so important in this is that the House of Commons no longer has the time to look at, and John will come in mm. on this, uh, a look at the details of legislation. Mm. Yeah. All the heavy lifting has to be done by the House of Lords, but mm. we dare not, for the lack of democracy, we are not able to push it too far. Mm. It's always felt, or oh, if we go too far, then we'll, there'll be repercussions. And, uh, and there are many people who, feel very strongly that, you know, that we could be looking at a terrible upheaval if we're not careful. John, uh, how do you how do you assess that? How how serious is this public order act? I, I think it is opposition? serious. I, I think it is serious. I mean, the difference, just to make a point, when the terrorist acts were passed, they were debated in full by the House of Commons and by the House of Lords. In other words, there was a debate uh, in detail on the bill, but what's happening now is this is, as Jenny spelt out, this is called background legislation. The reports in the papers this week that anybody that's uh, on a demonstration will have their driving license start taken away, for God's sake. And I, I came into politics campaigning on housing. And once we stop the street with mums and prams blocking the road to make a point because the authorities in the council wouldn't listen. Now in a local community where I am, the mums are asking for a crossing to a school. If they use their prams to go regularly across the road and hold it up for a while, they will be guilty of public disruption and liable to arrest. And I think the problem is that disruption has become the only way to protest in an age where political polarization has meant that the strength of argument and respect for an opposition argument has disappeared, not only in parliament, but in the media to a large extent as well. It's incredibly po polarized. You're for it or against it. And the alignment is often very, very unevenly balanced and that means that ordinary people's attempts to make a public noise of protest is becoming increasingly difficult and dampened down so i think it's not just about the commons and the lords and democracy of course isn't just about elections and westminster it's about the people's engagement in politics at every level for change even at a micro level and i think at the moment there's a real shift in terms of uh, I'm almost tempted to say plutocracy, really, where a government for the uh, by the better off and for the better off holds on to its power at all costs. And I think we have a real issue there in British politics of how we turn the whole apple cart upside down to rebuild from local communities and democracy, which I think in some ways the history of the world's in the early stages. We've got to rebuild it from the base up. I'm going to have another question about the Public Order Act in a moment, but I just want to say to our audience, that if you do have questions for the latter part of this program, now would be a good time to put them in the Q&A button that appears, uh, should appear at the bottom of your screen so that uh, Mike Scott and John McCabe, our colleague, can sort through them and, and put them in some kind of order. I, my question for you about the Public Order Act is this, is there a role for the courts in this? Is, could could uh, citizens, could nonprofit organi organizations, could protesters bring a lawsuit saying this was improper mm -hmm. for, for, mm -hmm. for Parliament to do and, and somehow get it reversed. Mm -hmm. is, that a, is that an option in the UK? Max? Yes, I'm sure they could challenge it in the courts, but if the law is the law, uh, the court's role is to interpret the law. So mm -hmm. I think that's the problem here, right? Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, Britain does not have a constitution uh yeah uh, it has it's not a written constitution in a single piece of paper like in the us and so obviously an yeah. incoming government next year would be free to change this law and uh, alter it to make it potentially more amenable and that's a big question as to whether um you know if the labor party does win the next election we will see some of these laws being rolled back or not but uh, they've they've you know, been fairly quiet on this, actually, um, which is maybe worrying on some some points. I mean, I feel like that you would expect them to present themselves potentially as a more liberal alternative to the Conservatives, but they have to still play 
to their own sort of conservative working class base. So they've been very cautious about what they're going to do. I don't think it's the working class base. I think it's the media annihilation that we'll get if we raised it as the issue and we'd be pushed on to distraction politics again. Dead cat theory. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> Is that right? But hopefully there will be change. What, what, what do you on, think about this? I just think also on the legal point, it's worth mentioning to loop back to the earlier part of our discussion about Brexit. Right, that one of the mechanisms for challenging um, you know, things affecting civil liberties um, you know, prior to Brexit would be an appeal to the European Court of Human Rights and to European authority beyond British authority. And the decoupling mm. of Britain from the European Union then sort of forestalls that other avenue of challenge um, to, to British legislation. So. Britain is still subject to the European Court of Human Rights. Mm. Mm. I mean, it's not right. really enough that. Yeah. Um, so um, there is still that avenue potentially for, for yeah. personal freedoms. Um, Max, you mentioned earlier that the law was brought in in part because of the threat of protests against the coronation of King Charles III. And so um, I don't think we should fail to pause and say, is there some... Uh, disenchantment with the royal family. You'd never know it from following it in the American media, but is there some <laughs> is there some movement against uh, the no. monarchy? <laughs> the answer is no. Uh, they, the the British are actually remarkably faithful to the uh, to the to monarchy. Mm -hmm. I, I looked this morning at the latest polling numbers, and I think there are it's sort of fourteen yeah. percent want you know, like you know don't want a monarchy. Uh, so it's very low, and it's been that way for decades. Yeah. And the British actually love love the idea of monarchy. Whether they love their monarch is another question. <laughs> uh, King Charles's popularity is far below that of his mother's. I think it's running at about fifty percent at the moment, and yeah. it's been trending down ever since he became king. So I suspect there will be a sort of awkward moment where there's a series of polls published showing Charles has got less than a fifty percent approval rating, and maybe he should step aside for his more popular. Mm. Son William, I think that's where it, that's mm. where it's going to go. Mm. I don't think the Brits are going to abolish the the king or queen anytime soon. But if, if you were a, if you were a government wanting to introduce a hugely controversial law, then uh, the hiding behind the smokescreen of the king's coronation uh, is a nice sort of uh, a very patriotic way of appealing to people and overcoming uh, objections that some people may raise. Um, the truth of the matter is that this, uh, the excuse was used uh, of the coronation for, you, for giving this piece of legislation its first outing. Mm. Actually, the origins of the legislation lie before the queen's death. Um, and so, you know, the whole thing is a little bit spurious. It's, it, it raised prominent, it came to prominence at the coronation. It wasn't caused by the coronation. Mm. What were the original causes, do you recall? It, it's, the, it's the just stop oil. And, the, you know, we have a government that is very gradually clamping down on protest. It's not the yeah. first time we've yeah. had this. Um, mm -hmm. And um, we have, I mean, we haven't yeah. mentioned so far that, th that there are all sorts of other ways in which yeah. our democracy is gradually being eroded. Mm -hmm. There's okay. devolution. Um, devolution is being chipped away uh, at the edges or being just ignored downright ignored by this government in a way in which and they override it um, and there are other things uh, that several other pieces of legislation mm -hmm. which are regarded as super skeletal that's the technical mm -hmm. phrase that mm -hmm. is used oh. these are skeletal bills in other words their bare bones are there and we leave secondary legislation, which, as I've already said, has very little scrutiny to fill in the details of what it really means. Yeah. Now, that's a dangerous way to run a country mm. because it leaves too much power in the hands of ministers, whatever co colour their politics. 
It may, may, may I add, it's, it's not just yeah. in Parliament. At the moment, we're, we're entering a, a period of an election that's coming up on the horizon, maybe within a year. And I, I serve on some national charities, some of which are campaigning on things like refugees and asylum seekers and poverty. Um, we're already getting messages uh, from the charity commissioners were told to tell us that we will have to make sure we operate within our uh, rules of association. In other words, we're not allowed to challenge government policy. Now, the charity commissioners, interestingly, said they weren't willing to pass that message on. So the government has gone to the election commission and the election law and is now asking charities to register with the election commission if they intend to campaign and lobby during the election period. There are 29,000 charities working on all kinds of areas on poverty, um, housing, homelessness, refugees and asylum seekers, all now worrying that they're going to have to pay a fee to register to say that they can even question MPs about policy. And if they do it without registering, they will be fined and squeezed out of business. Now, we've never mm. had that clamp down on the charity sector in Britain before, which is really a silencing of dissent and questioning, even to ask an open questions of all the parties standing for election. That's never happened before, but it's an attempt to hold on to power at all costs. And I think that's where we are in Britain at the present time. That is disturbing. Uh, I should mention that this is this particular program is part of a series in which we've talked about whether democracies are endangered or whether there's some hope of democracies coming back in other parts of the world. And we often find ourselves talking about, well, how can things be adjusted around the edges? How can democracies be fixed? And uh, the, the, uh, I recall from my time living in the UK quite a long time ago as a student that proportional representation was often raised as a way that the United Kingdom could perhaps become more democratic. Laura, what do you think about that? What do I think about whether it would make Britain more democratic or what do I think about the feasibility of it? Um, Both. I think it probably would make Britain more democratic. Um, I mean, we should perhaps have, pause and as explain. in the United States, Britain has a first past the post political system. So whoever gets a plurality of votes wins the seat. Um, the difference is that there are many more third party candidates who do run um, in the United Kingdom than in US um, elections. So you have not just the Liberal Democrats, but the Green Party, and then local parties within the various nations of the United Kingdom, so Scottish Nationalists, Welsh Nationalist parties. Um, those latter ones, because of the, the geography, are, are often able to secure seats, but it does um, mean that parties like the Greens and the Liberal Democrats don't have a proportionate representation in the House of Commons. So there's a democratic argument, a strong democratic argument in favor of proportional representation. But um, the Tory party doesn't back it. The Labour Party has been very waffly, but Keir Starmer, who's the current Labour leader, um, has indicated he's not particularly in favor of proportional representation. And so I think that the short term likelihood is not great unless Labour comes back without a majority after the next election, makes an agreement in coalition with the Liberal Democrats to come into power, and as a quid pro quo, offers the Liberal Democrats proportional representation. I personally, I, I, John and Jenny might have different views, I personally do not think that is likely to happen. Um, but that seems the only route yeah. for PR mm -hmm. in Britain. I I think that's a, a, a very accurate presentation, Laura. What, what I would add, though, and I used to be against proportional representation and argue with Robin Cook, who was passionately for it, one of my colleagues, sadly deceased. Now I'm passionately in favour of it. But I think it will happen from the base up. In other words, there'll be more democracy at local council level. And I would love to press the Labour Party for more power and money to go to the local. And then if we had proportional representation at the local level, it would then seep through to the national. I don't think MPs are going to vote for it. But think of the mayoral elections. We have PR at the local elections for mayors already, for the regional mayors, the Yorkshire mayor, the mayor of Manchester. We've got it in Northern Ireland, we've got it in Wales, and we've got it in Scotland, and we had it in the European elections. So it's not unknown at the local level, if you like, and I'd like to see the push from the base now as a way of doing it. And if you couple that with more powers of money and budgets to the local and region, I think you've got a package that might convince even those at the centre 
that it's in their interest to back it. So give me 10 years, I think we'll get there, but from the <laughs> local first. <laughs> okay, I'm going to see if Mike Scott is ready to uh, pass along some of the questions from participants on, uh, on Zoom with this program, and uh, we'll continue the discussion that way. Mike, over to you. Well, thanks very much. This is all very, very interesting. Um, we have a question in from Pam Williams. How well is Britain's press TV doing in raising and debating honestly the issues the panel is identifying, in particular, the gap between much of the community and the political process? A very good question. Mm. John, you want to start? Who, me? Yes. Yes, I, I think there is a gap. And I think the, the reason is um, the press has gone to this notion of balance. Well, we've got quite a strong partisan press and we've got partisan phone-in programmes. And quite often there's talk of the Americanization of uh, the chat shows and the phone-in programmes being a bit weighted and that they tend to be populist, but also very, very binary, for or against. You know, uh, thousands of people may support the idea of climate change, but one person doesn't, but then they put them on as if they're on a par. I just give that as an example, but that happens. Yesterday, there was a programme on um, what was called greed inflation about supermarket prices, and it was a phone-in programme with a panel. But as soon as that one person on the panel suggested that greed inflation by the supermarkets and their profits were the issue, it was ruled out that profits wasn't a word they could discuss because we're discussing trolleys in shoot supermarkets and prices. So there's some kind of red lines in the debate sometimes that weights the argument. So I think um, the youngsters have got it with the social media and they play it wider. But at the same time, as we all know, social media can be divisive and misleading as well with fake news. So I think the key is that the conversations on the street, the one to one, the face meetings, in other words, the traditional street politics will have to come back to change opinions. Because I think at the moment, the media is kind of polluted by this false sense of balance that tends to defend the status quo. Jenny. Uh, well, the the broadcast media um, has, ha, I agree with John, has wrestled with the idea of balance. Um, the BBC has really been at the eye of the storm. Um, there's been huge controversy about the BBC's interpretation of uh, of its ro role as being unbiased. Uh, setting out the the full spectrum of opinions, which they uh, which they fell very far short of um, over the issue of climate change. They they fell badly short on that on on the bre post Brexit era. Mm. They were frightened to use the phrase Brexit mm. as a cause of our economic troubles. Um, there have been attempts by the government to uh, skew the BBC. Uh, towards their point of view, whereas traditionally it's been uh, very equidistant and so on. Now, and therefore, for that reason, you often get a much a much more lively and balanced view from, from ITV, for example, or Channel 4. Mm. Um, when you go to the print media, the, re the, 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 the broadsheets, as we still call them in Britain, uh, are much more balanced, but the... Um, the red tops uh, are very heavily weighted towards the right wing. And um, you've really explain what got... the red tops are. I think that. Oh, they're the small populist, lots of the pictures. Sun. Yes. I don't know what you call them in, in the States. But, yellow, uh... yellow press. <laughs> oh, right. Tabloid. <laughs> tabloid. Yeah. Tab... <laughs> well, tabloid, therefore, is, is a. Uh, is a, a word we can all understand. Yes, it's an alternative phrase, um, uh, but they're they're very heavily slated, uh, steered towards the right wing in Britain, and uh, and that's a very unbalanced view. It has it has really um, steered the debate in one direction, but then Max could might like to come in and talk about the the health of the. Uh, 
the print media anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously I'm biased, but I think, um, I mean, I think Britain, having worked in several countries, I would say Britain is served by a very rich and diverse media. I think having the BBC, if you compare to the situation in the US, uh, having a state funded broadcaster here, uh, it does change things materially, and it is a it is a, a trusted source of information for many people in the UK, uh, and I think it uh, actually does a pretty good job on the whole, actually of informing and trying to at least present a, a factually correct picture of what's going on. Um, but I mean, politicians love to blame the media for the fact that they are not in office or they are their policies have been ignored. And it's not that their policies were rubbish. It was the fact that they were badly communicated by the media, which is why the public didn't vote for them. And it's a well, you know, so that's a well-trodden argument. In uh, and 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 you know, I think the British media actually, and I know many of the journalists who you know who work in this field and work in the lobby and so forth, and they try very hard to try and tell a, a true and accurate story. And we see attacks on all different political stripes from the press. I don't feel like, um, you know, that, that any side is particularly spared. And obviously there may be instances where that is felt, but I, genuinely, I think it's a, it's an aggressive media we have here compared to other countries I've worked in where actually the media is largely silenced by their by their proprietors. And there isn't this, this desire to cause trouble, which I think you usually find in the British media and I think is very healthy. Laura, what's your impression of this? Well, I mean, I started out um, as a media historian, really, and I, I sort of came into um, looking at politics through looking at um, particularly the tabloid press and um, and the BBC's treatment of politics. And I think Jenny is right, you know, in emphasizing the difference between broadcast media in the US and the UK. But I think there's also a significant difference between journalistic media. Um, because you know, Max writing for the Wall Street Journal, while well, the Wall Street Journal editorial page has a very distinct editorial policy um, that shines through aggressively and is often you know, at odds with what is written in its news columns and arguably in, to a slightly lesser extreme, the New York Times has a similarly defined editorial line. The actual news on the front page um, between those two papers on a day-to-day -day basis is less wildly divergent. Whereas if you read the Daily Telegraph, which is a conservative paper in Britain, or the Guardian, you could ha literally have a very different understanding of what the world looks like just only if you read the news columns, leaving mm -hmm. aside the leader pages, um, because the editorial policy permeates the news, I think, mm -hmm. much more aggressively. Yeah. And so you do have a broadcast media which is attempting some real definition of fair and balanced, um, you know, compared to broadcast media in the United States. But I think you have a, on the flip side, at both the tabloid and the broadsheet level, a more politicized print media. Um, and in that people consume non-internet news in Britain at a much higher level than they do in the United States, I think that there is a sort of significant um, difference on both ends. You know, I mean, I knew, I had a friend who told me that when they were moving house, they took a portable radio. This was before internet streaming um, of, of radio, um, as they were looking at houses to make sure they'd be able to pick up BBC Radio 4, you know, that that was going to be a determinant whether they bought the house, right? I mean, people consume, I think, um, radio news and, and print media more in Britain still. So they have a larger impact on discourse at both mm -hmm. ends. John, John, do you think that's a, uh... That's the case in relation to the advance of uh, the mass media, you know, of uh, TikTok and so on, that, that might be putting putting out news and having an uncontrolled, or at least the people don't know what the control is. Yeah, I, I think in my neighborhood, you'd be hard pressed to get a newspaper. No one looks at a newspaper. No one looks at the news either. They would work on social media a bit and the ones that are more media savvy. But in working class neighbourhoods, they do this. Even the BBC is now, because it's rubbish by the Conservatives, is seen as fake news. And it's a case of the gap in politics and the people being replicated in people's attitude to loss of trust in the media as well. And, and I think it really is 
it, it, it may be not a 50-50 divide in the country, but it's certainly, I think, a 30%, 70%. Now, you could say that you continue with the 70% and work over the communications there. And I take Max's point that the media has to do its best to communicate truth and facts. But we're in a world where that has been massively undermined. The trust in, in language, in reason and argument, and in telling the truth has been undermined in Parliament, not least by Boris Johnson. And that has done a tremendous amount of damage in the sensibilities of the people in who they trust. They trust neither the politicians, the papers, nor the police. And that is very, very damaging to rebuild that trust, which I think Jenny was hinting at earlier on. She was talking about rebuilding trust. That gives us with quite a systemic crisis in society for rebuilding democracy. So I, I don't take a quick and short term view that simply re-electing the Labour government sets the balance back again and all will be hunky dory. I think we've got quite a deep systemic crisis because of that crisis in truth telling. Jenny. Well, I, I, uh, I would like to follow straight on from that because I think uh, John has hinted earlier on um, that uh, the Labour Party has been disappointingly bold on certain key basic things. Now, you might be surprised to hear me say this, but you know, I, I am hoping that the Labour Party will do really well at the next general election, because I think Britain is desperate for a change of vision, a change of personnel. Um, and we are desperate for a group of people who are more competent. I mean, what we haven't talked about is the fact that all the problems mm. we've been referring to um, are, un uh, are underscored by uh, actual incompetence in our current government um, under several prime ministers and also um, a, a, a tendency to lack a coherent, consistent vision. They, you have a bright idea one day and by next month it's been dropped. Uh, so the time has been wasted in dealing with a very serious problem. So um, what I think we need in Britain is a, an, a fresh political approach. We have to look to the Labour Party as being in the lead on that. Obviously, I hope the Liberal Democrats are going to be um, doing really well in the election. And, uh, you know, there are all sorts of signs that uh, after a period of uh, serious uh, fall in our support, that we built back up again. So, so that'll be good. But the point is, we need a Labour Party with some strong, good visionary ideas, with some Agreed. strong, good visionary leadership uh, mm -hmm. that is going to, to deal with that lack of confidence and lack of trust. And I think that uh, we, need, we need a whole range of new politicians coming in to take that lead and hopefully to un overturn some of the legislation that we've been complaining mm -hmm. about in this discussion. Mm -hmm. Max, Max, how do you feel about this? Do you, for example, looking at parliamentary conduct, looking at the way that you have um, questions to the prime minister uh, from one side to the other side, which uh, seems to have uh, degenerated over the last years into people just insulting one another rather than really debating issues. Do you find that that is the case as you look yeah, at it? Yeah, I think that is a really interesting point, uh, Michael, because you know, as was alluded to just before, a lot of this now is, is theatre in Parliament. It's about creating a, mm -hmm. a soundbite or a clip that someone can then put on their social media account to show that they're doing yeah. something. And so the more, you know, the more firebrand you are, or the more outrageous you are, or the more hardline mm -hmm. you are, the more likely you are to create some of this content yeah. and then be put online. And so I think that that's one of the, the main issues here is that it's... yeah. You know, you question the what extent the kind of scrutiny that's going on in Parliament uh, of many of these laws and how invested these people are actually in doing the very often dull job of listening to debates and then trying to add to these debates and alter 
uh, alter the laws based on those discussions. And I think that's been a real issue. And I, I mean, I also, I was, as you as, as I mentioned in the beginning, I used to cover finance and I came from finance to covering politics. And obviously the quality of people is very different. And that was the other thing that really kind of surprised me was that um, you're, you're dealing with, a, with, a, with people who have very different incentives and, and, and people who are fundamentally, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it, but I was kind of surprised actually by the by the caliber of, of person who's in government in this country. I thought that doesn't sound too rude, sorry. Um, and I think that was one no, of the things that surprised me. The problem, the problem with uh, restoring trust and going on from what Max has just said is that having said, you know, I, I think we need the Labour Party to do well. I don't see signs of it firing people up in the way in which the Labour Party did in the mid 1990s. Keir Starmer is no Tony Blair. Into, now, you may, John may say, thank goodness, but the point is, uh, we need, uh, you know, we need someone in politics who is going to be seen to be um, a, a strong leadership figure. And Keir Starmer is, uh, is not in that position yet, and neither are most of his front bench uh, mm. team who have not got the image, the vision uh, in, the, in people's <laughs> art and minds yeah. that uh, Blair's team had. Who were household I, I, names, many. I, I, I have to say, my MPs, Rachel Reeves, who took over from me, and Bridget, Bridget uh, Philip, uh, Phillipson in the North East, uh, there's some great people in that team that are as bright and sharp as we were when we went into power in 1997. But I just say to Max, and it's about the coverage of Parliament, I always, I, it's, a, it, it's been a jousting match in Prime Minister's question time ever since the, the television cameras went in and an MP called Ma uh, Tam Dayel said, don't let the television in because it will turn politics into performance along the lines of Guy Debord, who's um, politics of spe what was it? Spectacle, society of spectacle in 1968, he was saying. And that's what happened with donutting, as it's called, gathering around the speaker to be on the TV. I think that the real crisis is that some of the work, and I spent 10 years in opposition on committees underground in the committee rooms, where we did debate laws and budgets across the party lines. Yes, there were divisions, but you actually didn't treat the opposition as the deadly enemy. You treated the opposition of whatever party with human respect. And I think that has been dying in Parliament, where the opposition and the government, the parties don't speak to each other and cross the lines. And this notion that it's a war of hatred between the parties actually undervalues the whole business of reason, argument and discernment. And if we covered some of the committees, there are still committees discussing, for example, the budget for weeks on end, I know, uh, education bills, health bills going through. If the coverage of those the boring meetings, if you like, word by word analysis in the back rooms was given more prominence and coverage, then I think the respect for what's done in Parliament might rise. But I knew as an MP, if I appeared in Parliament, and I once did, and said that Mrs Thatcher wasn't telling the truth, I'd get mega coverage in the Yorkshire Evening Post, and I did. And I met her afterwards, and she came up to me and said, uh, John Battle, how could you say that when I can't keep all the facts of Social Security in my head at the dispatch box? You were most unkind, she said to me. Well, I respected her for that remark. But now, as Max has said, you turn it into a soundbite, you get mega coverage at home. And the people at home think, because you've said three words in Parliament, that you've been working all week. And they do not know the work that goes on in the background, making laws and budgets, which is what Parliament should be about. But that's not what democracy is enclosed by. It has to be much richer and rooted in the actions and engagement of people in communities. Thanks, John. Laura, do you want to comment on any of that before I go on to something else? No, I mean, I'd only to make the brief comparison, if we think about um, the debt ceiling and budget bill that was just passed in the United States and the extent to which the kind of real work of hammering that out yeah. at a bipartisan level um, probably represents, you know, sort of more solid, um, mm -hmm. you know, 
legislative, um, you know, water carrying and real, real labor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it has been mm. not really reported on other than, you know, both sides claiming their victory um, mm. after the fact. And I think it does speak to the fact this isn't just a, a British political culture, a British media culture issue, John, but a, a wider issue about polarization mm. and the way mm. that politics are covered. Thank you. William Mitchell asks, uh, go on to a different area. William Mitchell asks, are the disruptive and sometimes destructive protests of groups like Extinction Rebellion exemplars of democracy or threats <laughs> to democracy? Max, do you want to try that one? Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, I was thinking about this actually just before we, we came on to do this, this program. I, I was, you know, because some people, in, if you talk to people in government who passed this uh, this this law, uh, the cracking down on uh, public uh, disorder, they said that, that in, a, in a way that people like Extinction Rebellion and Just the World were abusing freedom of expression rules and, and basically making the most of a, of, a, of a loophole, as it were, that would allow them to do whatever they want in the name of freedom of speech uh, to get their message across and that they were in a way um impinging on other people's freedoms to either to go to work or to whatever, take the train when these guys were lying down in front of it or whatever it is and so that's kind of what the government said it was uh it's, it, that's their reasoning now you know on some level you can say well that makes sense but another level you you know as we've discussed these can be abused this could be abused you know in untold ways uh be it you know this this especially you know you can have suspicion led strip and search now where basically someone can a policeman can say, well, I think you're going to be a nuisance, so I need to, strip, you know, I need to search you. And that could be abused in all sorts of manners of way, even if there's no evidence that you've done anything wrong. So, I, you know, it's a very, very difficult balancing act. And you can see how the government tried to approach this, uh, but you can also see how this could go dramatically wrong. Yeah. Laura? Sorry, I'm just muted, muting yeah. myself. But, I mean, you think about the erosion of of the right to protest um, and the kind of argument that if it impinges on other people's rights to live their life without inconvenience. You know, I mean, again, this is, is not limited to a British phenomenon. You think about the Supreme Court ruling in the US just this past week um, about the Teamsters Union in Washington state, which in going on strike left um, concrete in the concrete mixers and all of that concrete had to be discarded. And the Supreme Court decided um, eight to one that the, um, the concrete company could sue the Teamsters Union for the damages they, you know, and which is a real, in terms of a precedent, threat to the freedom and right to strike and right to protest, right? In terms of, you know, whether or not unions are going to be worried about their impending liability if their actions harm their employers down the road. But similarly, I mean, there's an intimidatory, intimidatory, is that even a word? You know, um, aspect of, of this legislation legislation in the UK, because if you don't know what you can do in terms of your, you know, rights of protest in a civil society without getting arrested, and if you see these stories splashed across the news media about someone who is, you know, arrested for holding up a sign at a peaceful demonstration, then you think twice um, at the minimum about whether or not to go ahead with any sort of civil disobedience. And it's, it's the threat almost as much as the reality mm -hmm. that's implied with um, with legislation like this that is mm. you know, most dangerous to democracy, I think. It, this plays into the trade union legislation as well, doesn't it? With the recent um, suggestion that trade unions, particularly in the public sector, in places like health or the police or, you know, key roles that they can't strike because they've got to be at work. But I think it plays in much deeper into the whole debate about free speech, actually, which is at the core of this. You know, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, some of the culture wars, but people's right to express things and uh, one person's free speech might be someone's ins insult if you like and that great debate there and, and I think we've got to keep into the core of that um, when does free speech jeopardize the nature of the whole of society 
and when does it support the common good of society? And I think that's the real debate. In, in a way, uh, my, my wife's a, a mathematician and she made the lovely remark that when Ricky Shunak was saying that everybody must stay, study maths to the age of 18, she said, well, as a mathematician, perhaps I would suggest they all study basic philosophy so they knew what reason and argument and having good and intelligent conversations and discussions were about. And I, I tend to go there that I think we've still a long way to go on the discussions in a respectful and listening mode where we actually tease out the arguments and work out what's reason and argument because we seem to have lost that in a welter of a emotionalism, if you like, that's overwhelming our debates and simply results in reactions, not in sensible agreement. Well, can thank I, you for I that. Make... I think it neatly sums some, some things up. Did, was somebody trying to come in then? Yes, it was me. <laughs> I was yes, going Jenny, to say, there's, there's yeah. nothing new. The suffragettes went in yeah. for very similar direct action to Extinction Rebellion. And we now learn about them and, uh, you know, <laughs> girls yeah. hold them in high esteem and they were doing much the same thing. Absolutely. Well, uh, I think we're going to have to bring this to uh, to a close now, but... Uh, I'll hand over to Sandy before coming back to close it completely. Sandy, you want Thank to you, Mike. say the last few words? Yes, well, it's very interesting listening to this because uh, running a free speech project, we're constantly asking similar questions and uh, in our case, finding that the disruption of speech is a convenient device used by politicians clear across the political spectrum, although they only accuse each other of doing it and don't see themselves as mm -hmm. doing it. So I suppose that's uh, not a surprise either. But uh, this has been very, a very enlightening conversation. I appreciate your participation. And uh, it's sobering to hear some of the deeper factors instead of just slogans about what's what's happening in the UK. Uh, thanks, of course, to everybody who tuned in and to our strong staff, uh, Georgetown University, for supporting us in this endeavor now for coming up on three years, actually, that Mike and I have been doing these monthly programs and uh, won't be long now, Mike. And, and uh, John McCabe, of course, is our uh, program manager here in Washington and does a superb job of putting these programs together. We're grateful to him as well. Back to you, Mike. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sandy, for uh, for chairing the, the discussion. Thanks to John Battle, uh, Jen, Jenny Anderson, Laura Beers, and Max Colchester. I, I found it a fascinating uh, discussion. I, I feel that we, it, we ought to take it on a bit further, you know, and there are various things that we didn't get to, like, uh, the breakup of the United Kingdom, for example, if mm. that's a possibility, and that these kind of issues. But maybe we'll come back in some months and uh, and debate some of these things again as we get closer to the UK election. Of course, there's a US election coming up not so far away as well. Uh, so I think it's going to be an interesting year as as uh, as we go on. Um, the next free speech project at the Crossroads International Dialogues event uh, with the Future of Humanities project will be on Wednesday, the 12th of July, when we'll be discussing when celebrities speak their minds. In other mm -hmm. words, you know, when a, a celebrity might go off piste, so to speak, and start to dare to speak uh, about mm -hmm. social or political issues. So that's a, that's a, something uh, to, to get our minds around for um, Wednesday, the 12th of July. and. Um, I think those of you in, in the UK will uh, will be thinking of um, of a certain footballer or, or <laughs> a football pundit who has recently been speaking his mind over government <laughs> policy. But there are plenty of other examples. My thanks also to colleagues in Georgetown, to the president, uh, Jack DeJoya, to the vice president of global affairs, Tom Banchoff at Blackfriars, John O'Connor, the regent, and Richard Finn, uh, the director of the Las Casas Institute, at Campion Hall to uh, Nick Austin, the, uh, the master of Campion Hall. And my thanks also to uh, John McCabe there in, in Georgetown mm -hmm. and to Laura Lees, my publicist, as well as to uh, Maggie Scott. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who asked questions, try to get through, through as many questions as we can. I know Sarah, if you're there, 
I thought that your question had already been on uh, Northern, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, had already been addressed uh, after your question came in, but before I was able to ask it. Thank you all for attending today and for your support of our various series, uh, especially, of course, to, to Sandy, the director of the Free Speech mm. Project at Georgetown. I'm Professor Mike Scott, Fellow and Senior Dean at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. You can follow me on Twitter at Mike Scott Prof. Until next time, take care, keep safe. And again, thanks to everybody. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, mate. Thanks, everyone.